Yo, do you think that um because like every single time I I'm like I check out this Zimbabwean society, right? It's like Pano Do you think that that DNA mechanism spilled onto you? Yeah, because of because course. Because you're, you're a pastor's kid, right? Eh? Uh, the, the PK syndrome is real, and that's because we grow up within the church, and sometimes we see things that we're not supposed to see, right? We see the inner workings, we see the inner sanctums, the inner belly, the darkness in, in, the, in the church, right? So you know which deacon is doing this with that, with, with this choir leader, and all these kind of things. So being a PK. Is, is, is a privilege because you're raised by praying people and you're raised in a, in a good home and stuff. You know, we never take away from that. But you also are not shielded like other church members from the nonsense, All right? Because right? you're in the house. You're listening to the phone calls. You're listening to the meetings. You understand the world. You're the counseling. Yeah, yeah bruv. So it, it's, it's, it, it's tough being a PK because then you're supposed to hold on to your faith when you actually see some dark sides of this faith, right? You see what people are doing with behind the scenes. You're dealing with, you know, money being stolen by ushers. You're dealing with all sorts of things under, in the underbelly. Um, and also, you have a Chatunga syndrome, right? Um, What's a Chatunga syndrome? You're the, you're the son of the big guy. <laughs> you're the daughter of the big guy, right? <laughs> all right. Um, so, so you don't even know sometimes when you're falling, when you're making a mistake, because... You can sort of get away with a bunch. Right. Because you're, the, you're the son of the chief, of the reverend, or the son of the pastor, right? Um, so, and so there's also high expectations as the son of the pastor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of the Bold Exchange. I am here with uh, father, husband, vendor in chief, Chibabache Kovo. <laughs> you hate that name. Uh, I don't hate it. Um, an entrepreneur. Uh, you're now into tech, right? I'm now into tech. You, when did you no, 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 no. I'm saying you're, you're now is like you're now into tech like full time. Uh, record exec. Uh, you wear so many hats, so I don't know how to like dis describe you. Kudam Sasiwa. What up, gentlemen? How are you doing, man? Alex, how are you right. doing, brother? I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Tell me something. You know, we're supposed to do this together like ten years ago. No, no, no. We actually did an interview that those other uh, items decided not to put out. Remember when I come, we came over to your farm and then we did oh, a. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, so, we were supposed to do this podcast thing a while ago, homie. Yeah, so I hope I'm going to... I think the out. time is now right. In, interesting enough, just looking back memory lane, so um, I remember, yeah, you're the, you're the first person who actually, like, got me my, my first laptop and Wi-Fi. Eh? Lenovo, yeah, yeah Lenovo. <laughs> and then, like, years later, we're here. I want to have a crazy, honest conversation with you. Let's do it. Um, How much time do you have? <laughs> ah, we, time. I think we got we got bandwidth. I think the people got data. So uh, this is. Tell me, you're born in Bari, and I always wonder why do you always bring that up? Because the way you always say, "Yo, I was born in Bari," like well, is that like a street, is, is it like a street cred item? It's like you flex throwing your weight around, like ah, me, I'm in Bari bread. Well, you have to understand that sometimes people don't understand the juxtapose or maybe the schizophrenia of my personality, right? I, I was actually born, sorry, my hands are crusty as death. <laughs> Thank you, producer. There you go. Um, so I, I, was born in, I was born in the ghetto, right, um, before independence, right? And then from that, immediately catapulted into the first world, into being an Australian kid who couldn't speak English, right? So it, it's good to sometimes explain why you were here the way I speak, sometimes the intonations are different. You know, right. the things that raised me are different, right? So I, I still got a very strong affinity to where I, where I come from, right? Um, I'm a Gutu boy, but I was born in Bari, Nishnari. You know, that's where, uh, you know, I'm one of the I'm one of the salads who can walk out there in the star bread and no one's gonna do nothing, right? Uh, I'm one of the guys who can walk out there and have no problems because I'm from there, right? And I understand the people there. And I've given back to that community and I've participated in that community. You've been with me in that community and uh, uh, and, and, and it's downtrodden, it's, it's been left behind. There's a lot of talent out there, you know, and there's a lot of people that we, who are ignored when we're living in our little golden cages in the Dell Dells, right? Yeah. So it's important for me to never forget where I come from. And I always go there to stay grounded because my nigga, at the end of the day, we are where we come from at the end of the day, right? So th that's why I always make sure people understand where I come from first. And so I wasn't born as a lad. So, like, you actually, uh, you're the pioneer of, like, you, you, you were in UK before UK was, like, Kwazana East. Right. Uh, tell me about that experience and why did you get back? Why did you come back from the UK? 
Well, so in my era, we could get onto planes without um, without visas because of the, of the Commonwealth arrangement. Right. We could get to England, and they would give us six months to do whatever we want, whether it's look for schools, look for work, and then you could extend your visas in every direction. Right. Um, so I went to the UK. I, mean, I, was, I was doing articles with Ernest Young at the time. I went to the UK just before the war vets were given their man. And our dollar was was strong. Um, so I could actually raise my money after doing a big you know, audit at Leopard Rock. Um, and then I would go, we went to the UK. I was actually visiting my girlfriend at the time, the mother of three of my kids, actually. Um, and then the war vets were given this up crazy amounts of money. I remember clearly the day because I was I was London's uh, carnival watching DMX and stuff, right. and then I came home and my dad told me pretty much that oh my gosh the Zim dollar has now what has now tanked, um, and this is the time when we're using Zimbabwean travelers checks in the yeah, UK yeah, to live, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So all of a sudden the travelers checks which were valued at so much are now like well, the, slashed uh, yeah actually like seven hundred pounds yeah, it was yeah. now seventy pounds like my gosh so uh, that's how I ended up staying in the UK and I was there for damn near fifteen years of my life. Um, just, you know, went to university, raising a family, you know, working um, and watching the country that I had left, which was actually, you know, on the up and up, pretty much come on the down and down. That was the thing. How crazy was that experience for you, just being that side? And well, didn't you get lonely? And where does this, uh, where do you fall in love? Because you, you mentioned earlier that you were like at a DMX concert. So when does this love for hip hop and everything, art and music and creative uh, come about? It started here, actually, you know. Um, we used to be in a Christian rap group with Zabs and them uh, at Calvary Baptist. I mean, they gave us a lot of opportunities as youngsters to grow and, 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 and be teenagers and love the music we love. But there was a way of trying to shape us and keep us away from the negative stuff. In those days, it was quite hardcore, right? Uh, NWA. No, it was, just, it was just glue, man. Come on, rather than that hard. I mean, people were just having glue back in the in your days. That was the hardest drug, right? That he had yeah, to but I mean, the, the, the rap that was there was gangster rap. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. NWA and stuff. So um, we, were, we were sort of shepherded to other types of rap, you know, uh, gospel gangsters, you know, uh, EP, you know, there's different types of Christian gospel that was coming out of the States, which our parents really tried at Calvary to get us into rather than getting into some of the other negative stuff. So that's how we got into hip hop when I was in Zim. Pretty young, actually, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13. I think 13 when I came back from Australia. So we got deep into that whole Christian rap vibe here. Um, and that's what sort of got me loving hip hop. We used to make it like on our keyboards at church. We we're part of the praise and worship team. So not only are we pray, uh, playing the praise team, you know, I was on the keys and Zab's on the drums and, you know, Red was on piano, or whatever, but then after that, we did not make hip hop beats and record them on four tracks. So that was good you, vibes at the time. You, you mentioned a lot of church, right? But like me knowing your work and what you've done, right? And some of your tweets and stuff like that when you talk about like, um, when you talk when you talk spirituality and religion, right? Yeah. Are you an ATR person or are you a Christian? Because like looking at your um, your the project that you put out, uh, award winning project uh, with Guru Guru, right? You've got uh, I think it's your daughter that's got a red so on and you yeah. know, it's very spiritual and you know yeah. mirrors and whatever whatever and then now you come from a Christian background so like where do you stand in the spectrum of like spirituality and then the next thing you're on Twitter saying no this this togologies and whatever don't exist like what's your take on when we talk religion yeah I mean I don't believe in fairy tales in any direction right um so are I don't believe in togologies are you say are you saying uh, like people's chivano is uh, fairy tales no I mean, in Christianity, it's got some fairy tales. I mean, there's a bunch of fairy tales that go around, right? So I'm generally, you know, spirit, spiritually speaking, I think my grounding is that I am a conservative Baptist raised boy who then got deep into, you know, learning the Mbira music and, uh, you know, African traditional religion when I was in the UK. And that's purely because you're searching for your, your, your who you are. Right. If your name is Kudakwashi in the middle of UK, or if you're in Australia and your name is Kudakwashi, you can't run away from who you are because your name is not the same. Yeah. Right. So you start to find, try and look for your roots. And I found my roots very close when I started playing Dambira. Because I mean, I learned the guitar quite young. Dambira, I started learning much, much old when I was much older. And I was learning lessons from white people. You know, Erica Zim and you know Californians would come and really learn a bunch about our tradition. And I just found, I fell in love with them. Um, you know the depth of them and 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 the spiritual elements of that of that instrument you know contemplatively you can really meditate so you agree that, that these are not fairy tales or can you say zimu and war right it's not so you believe that this is 
No, no, I mean, the thing is, you, I, I want you to, I want you to please separate me from, I believe there's mermaids uh, and Jews. You believe there's Jews? No, I don't. I don't, I, I, guess, I, guess, I don't believe there's white people in, in, with fishtails in our rivers in Zimbabwe, right? right. I just don't believe that. <laughs> All right. but, but generally, like I said, spiritually speaking, the, the Mbira gave me a lot of grounding as far as my knowing and loving where I come from right. and not forgetting where I come from. Um, so, uh, like I said, Christian conservative raised very deep into music and, you know, our Zimbabwean ethnology and how the Mbira sounds and how it evolved and, and our spirituality as Africans. So I really learned a lot about that. So I, I, I juxtapose in the middle of some of those uh, spaces, but I don't run away from my Christian upbringing. And you don't run away from your roots? I, I don't. I All don't right, run away right. at all. So, no. you, so you, are, you are just one leg, gumbokuno, gumbokuno. Um, look, I, I, I genuinely believe that um, this is the iPhone 14 uh, Pro, eh? yeah. um, and uh, the 3GS is the, is the great, 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 great grab of this one, right? Yeah. So, Pachivanu, Mulanon Zimzukuru, right? And if you look at the breakdown of that word alone, right? Munkuru, right? The, the, the bigger person. And why do the Shonas believe that the, 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 the children are the elders is because of course we they have the dna not only of their great grandparents their grandparents and their, their parents they also have their own so they always considered the older on or, or, or the more superior version of the past if, if you know what i'm saying no, I hear you. I, so, I, so, I totally so, so if we talk about the mzumus of my wakurus and stuff i mean i i have to embody it because i have their dna okay okay do i believe that they're theoretically moving around me manipulating my current existence maybe not not in that sense but uh the knowledge the you know the lessons the the evolution that they had i also happen to possess and and, and my children will possess and greater you know what i'm saying so you, you got I believe in uh, this. I believe my ancestors living within me because of you know science. <laughs> interesting, interesting, interesting. You, you know, you 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 got um, you you got like you got a son who's now a teenager and um, you got daughters and stuff. Why do you, what what what's your take on? Do you think an Andrew Tate is bad for your son? No. You think an Andrew Tate is bad for your daughter? No. You see. Uh, and, and, and Andrew Tate will resonate a lot with uh, the way I would be speaking to my son, right? Uh, and the way I would be speaking to my daughters, right? Because, um, you know, the, the fact that the internet has exploded this particular male because he's a great poster child does not mean that as fathers who are present in our children's lives, we haven't been telling these things to our sons all the time, right? Don't run away from your masculinity. Don't run away from being aggressive when you need to be in aggressive situations. You know, fight for things. Protect your family. Protect your sisters, right? So you follow Shadai online? Um? You follow Shadai? Oh, no, he doesn't fuck with me at all. He blocked me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't yeah. like me at all. Um... The uh, thing is, it, it's one thing to be an Andrew Tate, one thing to be a Shadaya, you know, mirroring an Andrew Tate, and yet you're a fuckboy, right? <laughs> uh, like, because in the world of men, a Shadaya can't stand, right? I've been in corporate Zimbabwe, I've never seen him. I've stood in the biggest boards, and I've stood in front of the biggest, most wealthiest people in this country, I've never seen him. I've never seen him aggressively put himself forward as a, as a, you know, as an alpha male in this particular country. I've never met him. I've met everybody. I've had to fight with the biggest guys. He's never there. So I'm saying he's good for him to be a like poster child on, on, on Twitter. But I'm saying if he really wants to be, if he really wants to do this, man, come and compete in, in, in the league. And the league is brutal, right? Yeah, true. Yeah, there, there, there's, there's real men out here who are really fighting and who are really trying to, you know, feed their kids and feed their communities and really build their, their brands, right? So, so, so be that guy. So, so you're saying that the messaging is good for your daughter and your son, like the messaging and the entertainment and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean... When I hear the Shadaz talking about, you know, single mothers and all these kind of things, I think the message is lost in some of the misogyny and some of the, the and some of the, you know, the crassness, right? right. Um, you know, my sister maybe is a single mom, for example, right? She's not a whore, you know what I'm saying? You, you've, you've worked with my sister, you know what I'm saying? Strong woman, does, does well, whatever else, respectful, understands, you know, her place in the world, has raised, you know, a son who's now playing Zimbabwe rugby, you know what I'm saying, has blessed the community in more ways than you and I can even explain yeah. right now, Alex. That's, that's the truth, right? True that, true that, true um, so you can't just say all single mothers are hoes. I mean, that's crazy, bro. Like, 
But are, are we saying women should not be promiscuous because they judged Harsha in this environment? Of course, right? Um, women should, um, you know, should are the matriarchs of our homes. They're the custodians of our culture. We call it a mother tongue for a reason, right? Uh, when you're in the UK, my friend from Nigeria said to me very clearly, if you marry a woman from Ukraine, your children will speak Russian or Ukrainian, yeah, right? Yeah. If you marry a woman from uh, Nigeria, your kids will speak Yoruba or Igbo. If you marry a woman from, 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 from Kenya, your children will speak Swahili. Marry a woman from Zimbabwe, your kids will speak English. That was a tough lesson for me. Like, shit, we have to really remember that our mothers, our sisters, they are the custodians of our culture, right? They're, they are the ones who are going to keep our languages alive. You know what I'm saying? So it's important. So sometimes these messages that the Andrew Tates are saying, if you take away some of the crazy misogyny that's shrouded around it, I personally have never heard Andrew Tate saying anything I disagree with per se. Right. You know what I'm saying? Have I heard things that should I say I agree with? Absolutely. Because I think sometimes the message is now dumbed down to stupidity when it should be a message that builds community, builds families, builds family units, builds stronger men who can look after communities and, and be, and, and be and, you know, and, 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 and protect, bring str breed stronger women who can, you know, care for communities and nurture communities and protect communities. You know what I'm saying? I, I, so I, 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 that, that's where I would like to, you know, put it. I, 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 totally, I totally get you on that, right? And then you actually mentioned, like, uh, online and wah, 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 right? I want to ask a question. Like, I remember um, uh, we're in lockdown... You got your oxygen mask on, and I'm like, yo, this niggas are not gonna make it. This is yeah. crazy, right? Uh, by God's grace, you make it. Um, you know, you I'm recover, stubborn, right? You recover from that, right? And then there's an incident that happened. I don't know what you tweeted. I'm, I'm, I'm I forgot what you tweeted. And then there's something that I saw that was very nasty, where people started saying we should have never prayed for you, you should have died. And I'm like, yo, <laughs> this is the most ridiculous shit that... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right? So I'm like, how, how, how... Are we safe out there online? And you, and honestly, do I agree with everything you post online? Nah. Uh, nah, I don't agree with everything, everything that you post online. I don't agree with uh, the the pinch of salt and whatever you... How you dish out your... <laughs> how you come down on these kids and stuff, right? Mm. Question is... Are we being responsible online? Nah. I mean, look, I've been on Twitter since 2007. All right. I got 170,000 following followers, right? Um, and it's an abnormal place to be as humanity right now when I can speak in one tweet, one brain fart to more people than my daddy preaches to on a Sunday, right? It's, it's, it's abnormal, right? So... In, in that case, when you say, you know, we shouldn't have prayed for you and you should have died in COVID and stuff. I mean, these people are not God, number one. Number two, you can, you can bunch that cluster of people into a, into a handful, right? But that handful still, I mean, even if it's the 10% of my following, right? That's still damn near 100, I was 1,700 people saying that you, I wish you were dead. Right? That's crazy, right? So... It's easier to spot uncut grass than cut grass, bro. You know? So every day I go on Twitter, right? I must remember that I'm talking to 170,000 people sometimes. And sometimes my reach is talking 5 million people, right? And we have to remember that if 10% of those people don't agree with you, your, your Twitter timeline can look like you're hated by everybody. But that's not my lived reality, right? I'm in plain so much these days because business interests all over the, 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 the continent. And it doesn't matter what airport I'm in. I'm meeting Zimbabwe trying to high five and get selfies, right? I can walk. I, I can't walk around Zimbabwe genuinely. I can't go into a pick and pay in waterfalls or Bardale, uh without meeting 20 people who want to talk for a minute, want to swap numbers, want to take a picture. You know what I'm saying? So it's a very weird space to be. Um, where when you're talking, you got to understand that if I say something absolutely stupid, like, yeah, put, when you put metal in a microwave, uh, it becomes nice and shiny. And I did that once, and it actually caused shit, right? And, <laughs> and I thought I was joking. All right. Uh, take some foil, put it in a mirror like this, and it'll come out nice and slide. It was literally a joke I saw on somebody else's timeline, and I just reposted it. And I got people in my inbox like, nigga, man, you made me blow up my shit. Like, you made me <laughs> burn my microwave. Like, okay, first of all, I'm not talking to... Not everybody is super intelligent. Not everybody is uh, is super cognitive. People, you know, so you have to be responsible in what you say. So I do think about that every day in what I do, right? I, I think about when I say something, 
Who's it going to affect? How is it going to affect these people? And am I being responsible as a leader who never chose to lead anybody? Um, I don't, I don't want to be a leader. I don't want to be a role model. I just, I just want to be a guy who talks my shit on Twitter. But the Kuda who was talking to 20 people on Twitter in 2007 should not ever believe he can still do the things he's doing in, two, uh, in 2023. It's just irresponsible. I've, only, I've, I've known you for almost like more than um, a, a decade now. Mm -hmm. And um, I've seen the transition. I've seen the growth. Mm -hmm. Especially... After you got on that deathbed, and then you came out, yeah, and then you came out a different play person. Um, How? I feel like you were. After, I feel like you started making more conscious decisions, and I thought you. I, I think you. I think it. You actually started going it, at it harder and chasing your goals harder, and yep. I think and being a more present human being to beat your family and everyone else. Um, do you think how what was going through your mind when you got when you had that that oxygen mask on, and you were going through what you were going through with COVID? Um, okay, first of all, I, I thought I was gonna die, right? Um, because uh, it's one of the most painful ailments you can ever get. Like your muscles start to really just give up on you, your lungs stop giving up on you. You you can if you don't force yourself to breathe. Once you're now at sixty percent oxygen, you pretty much can just say, I'm not going to breathe anymore, right? You don't have the strength to breathe anymore, right? And, and then you're hearing your wife on the phone talking to a hospital saying, we can't take him, we're no beds. And ambulance is refusing to come and get me because I'm bed, you know? So you, you, you think you're going to die, right? What's it? I was going to bed. I medical. I was going to And I'm medical aid, yes. <laughs> all right, all right. Go, 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 go. But then they still had no beds for me. All right. Because um, uh, remember that time, there was swamps, yeah, yeah. right? Um, so at this particular point, you're just focusing on breathing, 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 breathing. Um, and then you knock out, and then you wake up a month later. That's what happened. You like you wake up a month later, uh, but once you're in that coma space, you your brain continues to try and live reality, right? So you're still going to work, you're still trying to do things, whatever in your brain, but everything has changed. Like you you forget chunks of your life. I regressed to like when I was in London, for example. You know, my kids were still babies. Now to the 20, my God, I'm thinking of this Nintendo is still a baby, right? So you wake up and crazy situation, Alex. You can't see no human beings. Everybody's in PPE the fuck. So yeah. everybody's covered up. So you can't see their eyes, you can't see their mouth, you can't see their facial expressions. You're just hearing a bunch of nurses say, God, my God, God is God, God is because you're open up like, what the fuck is happening? Right? No one is explaining to you that. Dude, you've been in a coma for a month. You, 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 your organs were failing. You know, so you don't know what's going on, and that now goes on perpetually. And, you, and every time you fall asleep, you think it's another day, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's one of the worst things to happen uh, to to a human being, right? And and then you're walking around now at airports, and no one's in a mask, no one's in a thing. You know, it's, oh shit, was this actually real? Oh, I, 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 t I totally, I totally get you, right? And you know, uh, just before we wrap up on the on your uh, on your social media, right, and how heavy-handed you are to some people and aggressive to some, I always tell people that like uh, these kids, and I'll, I'll say kids because I mean I'm, I'm talking of probably people who never had to walk some distance to actually just get on a phone and be on a phone call with someone, right? Mm. So people tend to think that they can actually say something and someone doesn't react because i always tell people that like for every action there's a reaction negative yeah. or positive um do you have regrets with some of the stuff that you say as a parent because you know the people will be like yo but could i you're a dad yeah. or you you know what i mean like we can't be doing this or you're in a corporate space i've learned the hard way i've lost clients because of stuff that i've said on twitter yes yeah. i don't want to use my twitter that much do you have regrets on what you say online and for someone who doesn't know you because there's someone who doesn't know you and who, who's only met you in a hundred and how many characters are now there on Twitter? Two hundred or whatever infinite. characters. Yeah, you know what I mean? And they think, oh, this five percent of what could I say it or two percent of what could I say it online? That's a whole person. And then they like say, I don't. Want, what 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 would you like to say to someone who actually like reads your tweets and find? I think first you are they aggressive or you know what I mean? How? Yeah, what you, I mean, look, <laughs> it, it, it's it's a fantasy land. Right, the begotten son character on Twitter is not Kuda that you know, Alex. Yeah. Right. It's very easy to, to, to judge people on, on on online personas, on brain farts, on aggressive you know tweets and trying to and fighting off you know perceived haters and whatever else. But generally speaking, that's not that's not my character. 
Um, you know, I don't sit on the boards I sit on because I say fuck you every day, right? I, I don't have as many employees as I have because I just walk around and say fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Fuck you. Come on, dog. Like that's it's a different type of environment, right? So if you if you if you sift through the tweets, there's a bunch of stuff trying to talk about entrepreneurship. There's a bunch of stuff talking about building our country. There's a bunch of stuff talking about feeding ourselves and farming. I'm passionate about that stuff, right? And then you have one little weird moment when some dickhead says something and he's like, ah, fuck you. And then all of a sudden, you're Mr. Fuck you, man. Like, come on, dog. Like, <laughs> we're multifaceted humans, right? Take, take, the, take the, the length and breadth of everything that we're doing, right? And then, and then look at the media and say, how many times is Kuda fighting on Twitter? And you have to find, oh, shit, it's like twice a year that Kuda has had something bad to say to somebody on Twitter all right. who they don't know. But this person knows anything about you. See, he knows your kids' names. He knows your, where you live. He knows, he, you know, he know, he knows your businesses. But he's, you know, no four two six four or some shit. You don't know who this nigga is. We're actually talking about it earlier on. That like we're actually talking about it like just before you came through, and we're talking about how, you know, it's weird how you have the guts to, to try a lot of ideas and try fail, yeah. succeed in some, and then someone doesn't even have the courage to use their face and their name to share an opinion. And they can be online all it's day. It's wild. It's like, it's, 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 it's crazy. It's absolutely wild. But it's also a training in the sense that uh, it's a training even for you. And, and as you move, like, we, we can't get sucked into personal drama with people you don't absolutely you don't know. Right, so I want to be very clear. It's not like I read a tweet and I get really boiling mad, and then I'm like fixated for days on some guy telling me I should die. I literally say, "You, your mama should die," and I'm playing with my kids again, or I'm in a Zoom meeting with you know with investors, or you know what I'm saying. Like it's really something that you you have to learn to you need to learn to be a broadcaster and not a consumer. And a lot of times I'm fighting with consumers who don't realize I'm a broadcaster. You know. I say stuff and I walk away. Yes. I don't know some of these people. So I generally just do it. It's a fun space. It's my chosen social media network to play. Uh, it's not Facebook. I don't like Instagram. It's too many cute people. I'm not a cute nigga. Um, so I like Twitter because we can brutally bash. We have great ideas. You meet some great people. I've built some great relationships. Off Twitter. Off Twitter, right? We have sent damn near 37 children to university I'll with strangers I've never met, not met once. Like we're in a WhatsApp group, we get money together, we pay for kids to go to university. And all of them are about to graduate this year. What a fantastic story, right? We've raised money for our businesses off Twitter. We've raised money for political causes we believe in off Twitter. We have galvanized each other and pushed each other as men. Like there's a whole men's circle of guys who just, in a private community, who brutally bash each other every day on a business level interrogate each other's business plans. This will suck. This will never work, you know. And these I've never met some of these guys. They're all over the world. Some of them are chartered accountants. Some, so I've built great communities within this enclave of stupidity. And then there's this one big, you know, 170,000 that you speak to, and then you have to deal with a couple of nonsenses here, whatever. But on a day-to-day, -day, I get a lot more benefit than I get from for angst. There's something that I actually, that you mentioned that I actually want to follow up on there. You mentioned political causes, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you're the right person to ask this. And I don't have any nice way to ask this, right? Yep. We've both worked with this gentleman. How come everyone always thought that if Van Mahdi there was a project? How come every alternative voice in Zimbabwe is always pinned is a project? And how is, oh, is, is, is this, is this, yep. is this activism here? Yeah? You know, we've seen guys like Tajamuka, Stim, Joradza, like uh, all those guys. Yeah, I was with all of those. Did, right? yeah. And you've seen how money plays uh, how Zinemari, because like, is that model sustainable and do people get paid? What's, what, what's yeah. going on behind the scenes there? Because we've seen this and well, what, what's, what's happening? For starters, let's start with the, this flag. Was that a project? Because if it was a project, I mean, we're five years in, I, I'm not seeing any of these flag ones. Okay, so we've always been very good at what we do. Alex, and I'm going to rope you into this one because you were there at the very beginning of this, right? All right. You were literally there, right? So the first video that people saw of Fadzai Mahere online that went viral, you shot it yeah. on a cannon. And that was at the RBZ, yeah. right? The videos that were shot by Pastor E, we shot them at, at the crib where we were staying, right? right? Um, 
we were just very good at what we we're doing because not only were we doing corporate graphs, you know, chibuku, ani, 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 right? At the time, we were, we were bored and we started doing stuff for people like Pastor E, you know, for Daimaere, Tajamuka, etc. And it always looked like it was too professional for what it was. It always looked like it was, this is, there must be coordination, there must be a whole team, whatever else. And what it was is a small agency of knuckleheads who were just bored, right? And, and, and so it, the way it looked made it look like a project. Right. right, it made, it looked coordinated, but it's like Alex and Ino and these guys on on phones on Twitter. You guys could, could you guys could move crowds. You could you 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 the way you guys understood social media before people understood social yeah, media yeah. made it look like somebody was being paid. Right? How much did you get, nigga? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Now that's the problem. So so this this is across the board. This was an ED project. I never, I mean, I met the guy at my grandma's funeral because they're both my city, but I know him. I know some of his sons. I went to school with some of his sons. We're not one guy in them, but generally speaking, like, how, how would he be smart enough to make me a project? How would he be smart enough to make E a project? He was just a poor guy who was, who became a spokesperson for a bunch of niggas around him. You know, a lot of people then just wanted to add value to, to something that we believed in because his, his cause was actually correct, right? At that time, we saw things that were not going the way they were going. But the movement was not new. That was pretty much a spin-off of the Tongogara movement. That sort of had come oh, yeah, just yeah. before that with Junior Brown and the song as oh, well, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah, these yeah. are all just iterations of just youngsters gasping frustration using social media and using new tools so, on phones. So, so I, are you saying that because like, because it seems like there's a pattern, right? None of these movements last a year. You find uh, Tajamwa comes out, war with uh, Promise Mkwananzi, no, it will be seen. War, Stenzo Raza, whatever, whatever. Where is he? Diaspora. So, you, we, I mean, the list is endless, man. They always end up in the UK or somewhere. They're doing yeah. some, so, like, I say, I was saying that are, they, are these people genuinely in it for, for it or are they in it for the bag? I don't, first of all, I don't believe this bag. You know, I mean, if someone was given money, I don't know who was, but I, don't, I just don't see any of those guys as being very wealthy right now. Um, they would have made more money if they started businesses and enterprise, and I approve that. Uh, so, if it, so, but but what it is is that when the time when the social movement needed political strength, the MDC said no, because that was MDC air at the time. Yeah. So if Evan had had Trangirai then say, "Cool, let's embrace these youngsters and let's bring them in." It would have had the political will plus the social movements together. Uh, this time around, you have a strong political will with the CCC, but you have zero uh, social movements now galvanizing people who are, you know, who are not really into the politics. All right. You understand what I'm saying? So we have a strong political will right now, but we don't we no longer have the social movements to back it. The social movements at the time did not have. Uh, a political backing so they were not going to succeed because going up against a machine like like the Zimbabwean machine is it, not easy right uh, and and people burn out burnout is quick so which is why you notice that the political parties will come one month before an election they'll go hard and then they then they go then they go into parliament or go home right um if you try and keep people organized and enthused and and motivated for a year in this day of Seven minute videos on TikTok. No one's got time for that shit, nigga. I, I want, so now, speaking of politics, and you said you talked to something about uh, the, the uh, MDCA and uh, em embracing people and young ideas, right? And I've seen that that's been a problem with, uh, with a lot of political parties currently, even whereby it's really hard for them to embrace other alternative and divergent ideas. Yeah. Do you think that we suffer from a problem of big egos in our political sector? Like, do people have big inflated egos and they feel yeah. like they run a monopoly of being the only idea that people... Yeah, but this is not new, Alex. Like, politics, by its definition, is egos, right? Every, it's about big egos. People who are, you know, who believe they can run the world or run a country, you know, these are big ego-type characters, right? And then you, you have a generation that's growing up in the me-me generation, the iPhone, I, I'm this, I'm dope generation. So... If you're not willing to humble yourself to come to politicians, they're going to tell you to F off, right? <laughs> and, and at the same time, the politicians are never going to humble themselves enough to say, you know, we need your guys' skills or abilities and so on and so forth. So egos are always going to ruin collaboration. Now, people working together, it's always going to be ruined by egos, right? So there's many opportunities in our country like ours, right, where the talents that are in CCC and the talents that are in ZANU-PF, because remember, ZANU-PF has got talents, whether we like it or not. Right. If everyone had no ego, right, 
by now we could have easily got together and governed ourselves properly as a country right. so easily right we know the good people in, in 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 arts we know the good people in sport we know the good people in in commerce and industry we don't we seem not to know the good people in politics well <laughs> the, the good people in politics the only good person i know in politics is probably fortune charles yeah chibabas is a good guy He's like, like, uh, the rest I can't that's because of humility. I guess he's, he's willing to embrace all ideas and all people. And I think that's maybe the direction in which politics needs to go, where the egos are not the, the central focus, but people who are willing to work with other people to make sure that things uh, happen for the better. Look, if, if the government had come post, let's say, cool, not cool, right. and said, listen, opposition... Come, let's sit down and let's talk, right? Hey, my computers, my father, we take, my father, we let's all sit down in a room in the HICC for two months if we have to. And let's bash out the direction his Zimbabwe is going. With the goodwill and the, and the expectations at that time, it would be in a different place. No, you know, Egos. You know, you know what I'm laughing, right? Yeah. When you said cool, not cool, I remember you going online and giving, how much did you give away when, when, when Bob resigned? Ah, no, it was a lot of money, man. <laughs> It's thousands. I think I bought trucks of beer and booze and stuff. Interesting. interesting. I was ecstatic that the old guy had gone because I that's all I had known. I was 40. That's all I had known was him. Uh, and I was happy that he was gone. And I actually believed that something new was about to arrive, right? I didn't believe like what happened a few weeks later that the, the, the cabinet would be a bunch of war vets and more madaras. I I didn't believe that, that was gonna happen. But then hey, it happened. So <laughs> So my question is this then, right? <clears throat> um when, it could when, have been 60,000 I spent that time. I don't no, know. No, you no, were there. How much no, did I spend? I, 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 like, all I know is that we hit, <laughs> we hit the maximum on a lot of things. We hit a maximum <laughs> on a lot of things. What I, what I, I'm even on yours. I think we're moving yours. Yeah. yeah. Like, so, so, so like, what, what, what I want to ask then is that um, there's something that I want to clear up. And we, there's something that you said that uh, egos then make people say, no, we don't need these skills or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. there's uh, you're very essential in uh, crowdsourcing for... Um, in pushing the cause for crowdsourcing during the, I think it was a by-election campaign for the yeah, CCC. For the CCC yeah. You came in as a consultant and you... Um, no, as a volunteer. You're a volunteer, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> right? Because you believed in the cause, right? And then at the end, you see how how does it feel when you try when you bring in solutions because i've i've worked with you and i know that you're a solutions oriented person. How do you, f how do you feel when you get into a, a place where you're helping these people out and then the next thing, uh, they turn on you. Uh, Dark Knight feeling, die and be a hero, or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. Yep. Uh, how does that? How does it? How does it feel? And can you just explain that whole scenario and situation? Because you know you always then hear people then someone cheating guti pagaji gwa mar. But you if you ask guti ko two hundred fifty thousand ye mota ya gada iso ya gana gupi and then they be like, so you know what I mean? Like so just. Please add light to that. Um, look, look uh, you know, like I said, I, I volunteered because, you know, the, at the time, a lot, a lot, you know, people I, I'm friends with, people I'm, I'm, I'm close to were, 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 were have been recalled, people like Honorable Wende and stuff, you know. At the time, Fadi was now like spokesperson for, the, for that crew um, and so forth. So my, my volunteering was merely just saying, look, I think I can bring competencies uh, just from my experience in enterprise that could really help a situation like this, right? So m mass logistics, you know, moving a lot of people at, at one time, you know, correlating vast amounts of data. How do we put that into a database and make sure that we have a strong knowledge of where our people are, how they're moving, et cetera, you know? People donating and having to send airtime to individuals. You can't send airtime to 30 people in a day. It's, it, it doesn't work on Econet. But if you get, uh, you know, a thousand people willing to send to 10 people, you, you know, you've got 10,000 people who can, you know, agents who can have their airtime sent to their phones, right? And that takes coordination. It takes automation, right? And these are things that we're very good at. You know, we've been moving, you know, millions of tons of food every, every, every week, right? So we, we just plugged in our core competencies into that particular project used our social followings and stuff to raise cash and then distributed to make sure that, you know, we, and what we did was we managed to get 100% coverage of agents, 
at, at all polling stations, right? We had a command center. We had, you know, devices to input those uh, those V11s because my one of my biggest gripes was V11s were not available, the last one. We had 100% V11s on that particular uh, by-election, right? All put in, all, all correlated, you know, when ZX results were coming out, we knew what was dodgy, what was not, right? So that was a great experience trying to just show that this is a possibility as a test case of roughly about 10% of what's going to be happening in the bigger picture, which is now the 12,500 polling stations. So all that being good and said, I don't think anyone questions our competencies and how well we did in that particular by-election, right? What happened next is that a couple of surrogates and gatekeepers started going on Twitter um, and just labeling me an agent and all sorts of things, right? Now, as a human being, that hurts your feelings because you're in groups with the top leadership of these teams, right? And at any point, any of them can step in and say, yo, yo, hold up, my nigga, don't be talking like that to one of our G, to oh. one of our allies. A at any point, someone can do that. But they don't. So there's a swarm of this hatred that starts to come your direction. And one of the leaders calls you and says, don't worry, Munya, Anabasa. Like, yeah, Anabasa say, man, I see this nigga on people's timelines who are important. Like, how is he not important? And don't worry, we don't even know this nigga. And how am I worried about, how do I know that you're probably not telling exactly. the same nigga that this... So, I then go on timeline and said, yo, nigga, I just spoke to some of your leaders, my nigga. They said, you are Anabasa. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that caused an uproar, because then Fadid then tweets immediately, no, I'm not going to Okay. And these are the same niggas, they're saying happy birthday to whatever. Listen, and then the you, day you step away, you're like, you know what? You guys, let me not poison the village well, right? If I'm this agent, if I'm this bad actor, etc., and all the money and time I've put in is, 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 is of an agenda, let me walk away. And let me not touch this particular process so that I don't... Because you know what? The worst thing you can be is the guy who people believe is poisoning the G, the, the village well. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to be that guy. So you know, let me walk away from this particular issue, right? Let me not touch this particular stuff. Let me walk away. Let me go look after my businesses and my life. Very comfortable. No problems. I don't have to deal with this. Actually, it doesn't matter to me who runs this country, boy. And I barely live here anymore. You know what I'm saying? So walk away from that and, and so that you don't have to watch people you, you trusted and you loved and you, you participated and volunteered for stab you in the back constantly. You know what I'm saying? You just have to let it be. You walk away from it. Don't poison the village well. And hopefully those surrogates can now step in and then plug the holes that were left by people like me. And I'm not the only one. There's thousands of people who have participated, tried, volunteered, walk away feeling jaded, right? And hopefully the people who are not agents and the people who are not bad actors can then plug the holes. And we'll see how that goes. But as far as I'm concerned, no one has plugged the whole hours. So we're heading to a, a very interesting. Uh, we're heading to a very interesting time. Twenty three August, people are voting. And do you think? Do you think any of the candidates are ready for this election? Be it the the opposition, do you think incumbent? Be it the underdog, like. What's your analysis of this current, like this upcoming um, election? Because I've I've had the pleasure of actually moving around with Chamisa at various rallies and stuff. I mean, his popularity in the urban sectors is is undoubted. Like he's, he's a very popular candidate, a very very popular strong uh, presidential candidate. Um, uh, I have also managed to witness his uh, his team around him, like you know the people, the councillors, and so forth, and they're not nearly as popular. As the, as the candidate, right? So it's a weird situation where you have a strong presidential candidate and a very, a very unresourced, uh, maybe not even as popular, you know, base right. of councillors and, 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 um, and what's it called? And, and MPs, right? Then you have a juxtapose of the incumbent who is the most unpopular incumbent I've ever experienced in my lifetime as a 44-year-old man, right? Because I remember the Bob scenario. I remember, I remember what Zanubiev looks like in its glory days, right? When the commissars are on point and when the when the machine is fully pumping, right? It doesn't have to be this crazy visual bus people in vibe. So you can see that the company is not as popular as the old guy, right? 
But I have now also seen that he's got very strong local candidates who are also who are very popular on the ground. So let's not lie to ourselves. Scott is a very popular candidate. True. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, walk around to various constituencies and you will realize Oosh, the MP here is actually very popular. He drinks in the local beer hall. He, you know, and one projects. I do one day, one day, whatever else. So we'll see how this pans out. Popular uh, opposition leader, very weak base. And very the wild card? Oh, the wild card? He's only going to be taking away from the incumbent. So they're not going to let that happen. I just don't see it happening. And I know when this is coming out, but if they allow Savior to come in, he is going to be taking away from the incumbent, and that will usher in a Chamisa presidency. Wow, interesting. Let's talk about Maduangarwa <laughs> Big. Yeah, He's scammers, scammers, scammers. Do you, I, 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 Zimbabwe is very gullible to scams and scammers. No, Zimbabwe is very religious. <laughs> Explain that point. So, I mean, Maduangarwa Big, Magaisa, Magaisa, Magasida. Like me, I don't understand. We do Magaisa Marimdiro. We're made to, to buy bricks. So I'm saying, are we gullible for like. No, we're not gullible. We're religious, right? So. How does someone come and say, yo, listen, if you give me 15 bucks in two weeks, I'll be like, that's nonsense, man. No, it's not nonsense. In a casino economy, it's not, it's not nonsense, right? Because in Babu's Pinamari is the day-to-day -day that we do, right? We're highly religious people. We believe in God providing and so forth. You know, the 4419, Philippians 419, God will provide. Um, we're very high religious, and Ponzi schemes work only in very highly religious countries. So it'll be Indonesia, the Philippines, you know, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, very highly religious countries are very high with Ponzi schemes because uh, people believe in blessings, getting rich quick, and not in us, any of the other stuff, like hard work. Yeah. So uh, it's the only country in the world, for example, where you can walk in with a card, buy all the flour for what is equivalent to a dollar fifty, Gosh. step outside and sell it for two dollars. Right, you don't want even that use that card anymore. You know, that's that's the only country in the world you can do that. You can't do that anywhere else. You can't do that in SA. You can't do that in Kenya. But in Zim, you can do that. So that's get rich quick. This quick money is something that is ingrained. If you look at Tanaya, my 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 sixteen year old daughter, for example, she's been in Zimbabwe now for sixteen years, right? Since we came back from the UK, she doesn't know anything else. She can calculate rates in her head. Now, a 16-year-old kid should not be able to do that anywhere in the, in, in the world, but she can, right? So this is where we are. It's a casino economy, and people are going to try anything to, 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 to multiply the little wealth that they have or, sec or, 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 or secure the little money that they have. So imagine you have 10,000 bucks, you're a young kid, and you're like, shit, what can I do with this money? If I start a business, you know, Nura, if I put it in the bank, you know, Nura, um, what can I do? Okay, either I do a money change game or ah, pan e creator. You know what I'm saying? And currently, currently I'm, st I'm just storing my money in inbox. You know, money disappeared in Nikokesh. Well, of course, money disappeared in Nikokesh. Money disappeared in, 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 in Telecash. Money disappeared in one money. Nah, but come on, I trust inbox. Why? They sell chicken. Huh? Yeah. At least Why do you it, trust them? So it's not chicken. No, I trust them because at least you're not. At least then, at least digital. Re, this bank guys, you, you know, I, I think I put, um, I think I had money in my account, and then the next thing they're calling me like, yo, and this is like a, a, a world-renowned bank. <laughs> and they're like, yo, my G. <laughs> Maria we, we need no, we need more my cash to keep your account going. Your 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 iTunes and whatever whatever going. So that's why I actually think. <laughs> At least with inbox, I drew that part of the country. I didn't my charges and, you know, like just going back to the politics, right? Just for a bit. I want to ask, is there double standards in like, okay, are we as Zimbabweans a very double standard people? Because like you look at people saying, well, this is what these guys are doing, the incumbent or whatever, whatever, right? And then when you then look, take a closer look and you look and then like you look at them, they're actually slightly moving like the incumbent. So do we, is it, what, what are we what, talking about it? Yeah, we're just talking about politics in Zimbabwe that are we a double standard people whereby we set these high standards and then when the very same standards that we set are being, are being uh, required of us, that's very same accountability are being required of us. We then 
spring out those excuses like no, but no, but oh. So I mean, is is this the way yeah, we want to yeah, build a new mean, Zimbabwe? It, I mean, look, there's a lot of hypocrisy in Zimbabwe, right? I mean, people don't really want democracy in its fullest, ugliest form, because democracy is not pretty, right? Let's say, for example, um, well, what happened to Freddie Demo- Democracy Move? That be a uh, thingy thingy. Oh, the for this situation is dark, bro. I mean, what I'm saying is there's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of issues that have to happen when it comes to this political game, right? We don't want real democracy, right? If you want to, if you want democracy in Zimbabwe, for example, ask every Zimbabwean right now what to do with the average LGBTQ plus person, right? Democracy will do dark things to that human being. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if you say people's choices are to be followed the T, the majority, you know, burning a nigger would be nothing because of Zimbabwe's belief in certain things, right? Um, so do we really want real democracy? And speaking on that, me, I don't understand, good one. I know Tianzi, uh, like Zimbabweans, uh, that's where the double standard I'm talking about. Like people say that uh, we, they are anti, anti they, are, they, they don't support the LGBTQ in Zim, right? But I mean, you watch that delicious, She's getting like she's one of the most popular characters, characters in, in, yeah. in Zim. So you're like, yo, are we okay? But carry on. No, my, my question, my thing is though, do we really? I mean, democracy, for example, would say, um, you know, wh- when somebody questions where the car is, because I'm a donor to the car, right? Right. You, now you're a sellout. Now you're an agent. Now you're this. Uh, no, no. But uh, democracy states that there should be accountability, accountability, yeah, right? And transparency. And transparency. They don't want. They don't really want that. Neither does our government, right? So nobody seems to really want the real democracy. It's a, it's a word that is thrown out there. But in its ugliest form, real freedom of speech sucks. You know, well, what Kula says on Twitter should be defended by even his worst critic. Because democracy. That's, real, that's, that's democracy. Freedom, that's freedom of speech. Yeah, absolutely, right? You should be able to say, Ish, this person says some really nasty things about women, but I defend his right to say it. True. Right? Or, or, you know, but we do, do we really want that? And Zimbabwe is the kind who's, they will cry because I used the word Mata on Tron tw- Timeline. Now, I have 10,000 tweets <laughs> being mad at me for using the word ass. <laughs> then, <laughs> th- then they'll put me on a space and they'll be like, yeah, was it a bigger dick contest? I'm like, yo, nigga, I, I said Mata, you just said bigger dick. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is madness. I, I, we are I, I, a country I, of hypocrites. I, I hey, I, Do you actually believe in the concept of democracy, for starters? Me personally? Well, not in my not not in my establishments, right? Because in, in my in, in my businesses, I, I take a lot of the risk. My my investors take a lot of the risk, right? So uh, I don't then talk to my staff and say, "This is a democracy. Do you feel like going to work today?" No, we don't do that, right? We have to run it in 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 a semi autocratic way that gives room for people to be trained, see how they can rise. People can also gain wealth and people can, you know, can, can, can contribute to the building of our business because our fiduciary responsibilities are our, is our company and our investors. Right? Do you think that model can be adapted to like running countries? Because my, my, my problem, I'll, I've always said this, mm. like my problem, and I said it the last time I was talking to Ruti and I was like, yo, my problem is you can't have smart people and dumb people having the equal say in a matter. Well, I've said that too, and I've also been lambasted, right? So <laughs> in Harare, for example, as a homeowner, I don't want non-homeowners to have a say on who runs council. Because council is there to, to manage homes, suburbs, drainage, through that, through that, you through know, that. sewage, you know, um, how many people can occupy a person, bylaws, the way the houses look, etc., etc. right? So why why are you letting people who are, are not have, are not have no vested they've not invested anything into a into into the place to then be allowed to then have a say and that's what's happening bro all right the people who have invested the least in these environments have I the most, most say. say yeah and and that's why the dilapidation and stuff because running water tape no, no, because no, like, yeah, I actually, um, I was talking, I had, a, I had a conversation with someone and they were saying that, um, they remember back in the days, uh, they were like, yo, um, you weren't allowed to stand for any council office if you never owned a property in the area. Yes. Because you then understand, if you own a property, you actually then say, yo, I have the best interest because I'm trying to also safeguard my little... My, my investment. My investment. Yes. Speaking of investment... You are uh, currently a serial entrepreneur. You got um, 
You got your uh, Zivai, Zivai, right? Yeah. Zivai. Africa AI project. Did you, did you name it after your brother or? Yeah, my brother just happened to have a cool name that AI at the end. So. <laughs> and it also and, means gain knowledge. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and um, what what's it like um, running a, a tech business and a Greek business and farm, being a, a parent? What's what's that like being a serial a serial entrepreneur? Um, it, it's great because I I. I, I um, the perception is that Kula is running all of these things, right? And I'm too scatterbrained to do that, right? So Fresh in a Box is like six years old now. Right. It's come to maturity. It's not a startup anymore. Um, we've got great partners. We, we, me and the wife sold off a bunch of our shares uh, to great partners who already got retail stores and stuff. So that's a business that I know is running comfortably and is, and is well managed. Um, I don't actually get involved in the day-to-day. -day. I may have a meeting once a, a month about it and also customers still associated with me so i still have to deal with customers on whatsapp every now and then uh but that's pretty much my involvement in fresh in the that's box a, that's the reason why that number is no more you no more replying to our text on that fresh in the box number I, I, no one's replying uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> when i want to talk to you personally i'm like uh, Yo, that's the reason you migrated that number to someone else yeah yeah, yeah. i uh, mean because i don't have to run i don't have to be there anymore right so um being great at starting projects and getting limelight on projects and getting the branding up and stuff like that sometimes you're not the best person to then drive it where it needs to go right so um for example i didn't own retail stores i mean my my fleet of trucks was not enough to now cater for what's needed on the b2b right. which it has morphed a lot to become Right, it's more you know restaurants, big hotels all over Harare, Zimbabwe, and so on and so forth. So to get Kuda running that sometimes is a fallacy, and that that was not necessarily my, my calling. Right, uh, the the stuff I enjoyed with the fresh in the box pretty much ended about four years ago. Um, so now it's in the hands of people who we trust, who are partners, and they're doing a great job with that. So you you can leave that to the side and move on. And then Noma started a fresh academy thing, which moved a lot of the learnings and stuff. Because we need to train farmers as well. We need to have a great way of raising money for farmers to do that kind of enterprise. So she's deep into that space, which still plugs into the, you know, small older farmers plugging into the fresh in the box ecosystem. Then you've got the tech side of things, where Zivai has always been there. It's like it operated on fresh in a box. Those who've used fresh in a box always spoke. To, but in those days, it was called Lucy, right. um, which was an LLM programmed bot that used to be able to tell you where your order is, what you're doing, etc. So it's very smart stuff. So is the Zivai project is pretty much just spinning off a bot uh, because of the whole chat GPT vibe um, and just trying to give it to Zimbabweans. Because as you can tell, in this room here, no one can access chat GPT because we're banned. And our, our 20 other countries are banned from chat GPT. Why? My sanctions. I don't know if it's sanctions or just they don't want to be bothered with us, but... Come on, you if can't you say are, just 20 countries. Yeah, no, 20 sanctions countries, yes. Yeah. 20 sanctions countries, basically. So uh, sanctions do affect in... Oh, yeah, no, no, of people. course. I've always said so. I mean, that's, that's, that's without a doubt. Right. So, so Zivai is like, uh, is like give, giving Zimbabweans access to, to you know, chat GPT, image generation, you know, research modes and stuff. Uh, it gives people in Kenya the same access. People in Eswatini who are banned, you know. Um, so it's a great startup project of something that we've been passionate about for a while uh, that we can put some energy into. And I partnered up with a young developer, Alon the Cyprian, uh, as a co-founder for that. So that's his like baby, he builds that with his team and we're hoping to get you know funding for that and push that into the African space as a great African alternative to AI, right? So these are, like I said, when you have multiple little enterprises, you start owning various amounts of shares in various little things uh, that, keep, that keep your interest and in you waking up every day. Um, and right now, the tech stuff is what I've always loved. You know, with Fresh in a Box, building apps, web development. AI is the new wave, so we're really getting our teeth into that one. We don't know what the next wave is, but we'll always try and make sure that we're at the cutting edge of what's new technology-wise. And all Fresh in a Box was, was matching my wife's passion for agriculture and my passion for tech. So tech is always going to be the bedrock of the things that I do. How important, uh, speaking of the, like this African AI and like trying to move the... the, the the tech into um, into Africa. How important is it for um, Africans to actually own the narrative and actually like now tell their stories and depict themselves? In and you know like yeah. you know when you watch coming to America too, you then watch some funny. They say these guys are coming from Africa, but you hear some funny accents. How important is that for us? To uh, is it for us to actually control the narrative, control the way we see each other, control the way our kids see us? Themselves. Yeah. 
it is you know it's important question right so if you go on to chat gpt right now uh, and ask it a question in shona it will spit out gibberish right um for example you can ask for a meal plan right and because it involves kujiga and because it's trained on the internet uh, you can imagine the kind of things you know in um in conversations <laughs> right so it's trained on garbage All right. right so it says some rude things sometimes you know, you know what i mean yeah. terrible things right so uh, if you then type in for example um african at work it's always some nigga holding a shovel or a pick uh, in a gardener suit. You know what I'm saying? And if you type in, uh, you know, Englishman at work, it's always a guy in a beautiful suit, suit and yeah. so forth, right? Well, so we have not participated at all in the training of these large language models, this generative AI. We've been totally excluded, uh, and we may be excluded ourselves as tech, right? So what we're trying to do is say, look, how do we start gaining some of this, uh, some of this digital independence we so deserve, so need? right? Even the Twitters and stuff, right? I have 170,000 followers. Um, my, my impressions every month is in the region of, you know, 15 million or some, or some, or some crazy thing, whatever. People with 5,000 followers were getting thousands of dollars in checks last week. We're, we're excluded. Uh, but then our, 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 our tweets have still got ads under them. So we're excluded from this. So digital independence is something that we're going to have to work towards. We're going to have to start somewhere. You know, Africa Air Project is one of those startups that are saying, let us start here. Let us start by training LLMs on the open source space how to speak our languages oh, better. Yeah. Right? Let's take something like Stability Diffusion, right? And let's host it and let's train it up on pictures by Alex and 30 other great photographers. So that when we say black man holding a camera, it's a yeah. good depiction of a of, black of, man of holding black, a camera, black man holding right? Camera, yeah. So there's a bunch of work that we need to do to train these models, and it costs a bunch of cash. And we don't have that kind of cash yet. But putting ourselves in the space and say, look, let's take their tools. Let's take, uh, you know, open AIs, APIs. Let's take stability diffusion. Let's take, you know, all, all these APIs, whatever. Let's start training our things underneath those things and leveraging some of these big dogs like Google, etc. What we can get is a better experience for our people. So you can type in Shona on Zai and it will reply to you in proper Shona. You can type in Zulu, you can type in Ameik, you can type in Urdu, right? You can type in any language and we've now managed to make sure that it answers you properly, right? Uh, we, you can now type in a uh, beautiful woman and you will not get a, a, white, a white blonde haired woman on a beach. You will get a woman who looks like your mom or your sister or, or you know or a lady on the street, right? So these are some of the things that we're doing now. Whether that's prompt engineering, retraining models, or whether it's fixing quirks on on either side of these big giants, we're doing that to make sure that when you when it, when you oh, when you open this up, it greets you in the language of your choice. Oh, choice yeah, yeah. Uh, when when you, when you put in, I need uh, marketing advice, whatever. It knows that okay, Alex is in Zimbabwe, so let us not give him stupid ideas that don't work drop shipping on amazon i mean gee yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't work right so let's localize these llms to be really cognitive of where oh, a person well, well, is, is yeah, yeah yeah and then as we grow and get better and get smarter and get more money say cool we can now wean ourselves totally off uh perplexity or per totally off um chat gpt and now we can now have our own you know zim gpt which which knows and speaks us better and then this is maybe a long-term vision thing but in the short term now I was giving you guys a consumer app that you could use every day you know type in shumba msango in itsuro and you get a picture of a lion you know in the jungle with, with rabbit, rabbit. <laughs> nothing else yeah speaking of that how's um Philip, it's been a long time man how's uh uncle Polly? he good uh, all right speaking of uncle Polly. <laughs> I'm about to get into the UK, UK, UK migration. Do you think people who actually go into the UK are ever going to come back? Or people in the UK are ever going to come back to them? Well, yeah, yeah. of migration. So, so, um, you are now currently like a, a, a last time you're in the States, the next, next minute you're in South Africa, mm. next minute you're in Zambia, like you're a global citizen. Do you think that people are actually going to come back to them and when we talk of migration? Because like, you know, um, around, you know, the, 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 the amount of... I actually think that the stuff here, yeah, the... Yeah, the British is actually paid Nimadi Zerubadaran for these LLC items. Those guys are making a killing yeah. with, those, with those exams and stuff. So do you think these people are coming are gonna come back? Do you think it's healthy that we're exporting that much people at this at this rate? Yeah, look, when we left Zimbabwe when we left Zimbabwe in nineteen ninety six, we were always going to be coming back. So a whole generation you can look at right now, 
Uh, you mentioned Fadzaima Heri, Evan Mawarere, all these kind of people. All these people who were ex diasporans who went overseas and then came back to Zim. I just don't believe now, the people leaving now are, are the same because the, the circumstances are so different. The world has changed so vastly, right? So the only way that Zimbabweans are going to come back is our children who are being bred for export coming back to Tel Aviv, which is what's happening in Israel, where not all Jews live in Israel, but they've made it such a beautiful haven, enclave, that the teenagers will save for every summer to go to Tel Aviv to really enjoy their motherland, right? And this is what Zimbabwe can become. It can become a beautiful home for our children to always feel free to come back to and enjoy. But to say that the woman who has been a nursing assistant in England is going to come back to Zimbabwe to be a nursing assistant here, I, I just don't see it happening. Um, you know, because sometimes the money is not the same, you know, opportunities are not the same, hospitals are not the same. So we are losing a voluminous amount of people. As they breed and have children up, across the pond, more and more of those kids are just going to remember Zimbabwe as a distant memory. The job of those of us who have sort of stayed behind is say, how can we make this distant memory heaven for these kids to be able to one day aspire to she to come back to? Uh, and that's where and that's where we're going to become as as a country. You know, in South Africa, it's weird because I meet so many South Africans who don't have passports. They have no reason to leave. And, and the only reason why the only way we get people in Zimbabwe to stay is give them no reason to what to leave. To leave. And right now, there's a lot of reasons to leave. Um, people are struggling, right? Uh, people like me, I'm born of privilege, really, considering, you know, I don't ever feel like I'll be out of home or starving at my house or anything of that nature. But I know people who are in my staff complement who, if I screw around and they're not paid, they actually can go into destitution. Like proper, my kid will starve. Or, or someone's kid breaks their leg at a sports event, Kuchkoro, and he's looking at a $3,000 bill that, if, if, if I paid him great every month, he you wouldn't be able to afford you. it. Yeah, I, 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 I totally get you. And there's something that you say, right? You say that people don't have a reason to stay. But then I, then I, I, I want to ask this question, though. Do you feel like the news and the media and the way we're speaking about ourselves out there, just like, I know things are bad. Every country, there's bad things. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's just so much negative light shone upon Zim? Oh, and is it intentional globally? And how do we change that? Okay, so yeah, we Zimbabweans do, we are very self deprecating in the way we speak about our country. And that's because sometimes the people who are speaking like that are diasporans who are really struggling abroad or people locally who are struggling here, right? Um, what you need to do to appreciate Zimbabwe is leave and go next door. Any. South Africa. Zambia, Botswana, go there first. Then go to the next door to them. Um, then you start to realize how nice this place actually is, right? Uh, go to Ethiopia, uh, that smell of donkey that hits you at the airport, right? Go to Kenya. It feels like rural Zimbabwe in 1981. I'm, I'm not dissing these countries. I'm just saying that if you look at Zimbabwe, it's like, geez, dude, like, we have hyper accelerated incredibly. Actually, we're, actually talking about, we're actually talking about that. Like, to say, we take, okay, and I, I stand corrected. Let's say it's not even the worst place. We take, like, someone, people tell someone to say, what's the probably, if you, you're in a area, what's the worst place? You could not the worst place. Let's say Matabi. No, let's say Epoth. Yeah, let's say Epoth. Yeah, yeah, if we say, like, what's a ghetto is ghetto. Epoth is nothing compared to parts of Lagos, bro. That's what I'm saying. Not even parts of Lagos. And then you say, parts let's, of Malawi. Take, let's take the ghetto is ghetto. In say essay, dog, and then you like, okay. In Epworth, if I'm walking in Epworth right now and I see a man holding a machete and an axe, I know that guy is coming from or going to cut trees. All right. If I'm walking in Guguletu or Kailicha, it's and I see that. a man with a machete or an axe, I have to run for my life, <laughs> right? This is this is real real truth, right? And, and this is across the board, right? So South Sudan, I mean, uh, you know, parts of Rwanda. I mean, we, the beautiful parts that we see can give us this this inclination that we are the worst place on earth. Harare is not the worst place on earth. Blawa is not the worst place on earth, guys. Uh, you don't have to go far. You go to Mozambique, right? Go to Mozambique for for, for for a couple of days, and come back and tell me about sewage and drainage. <laughs> 
right? There's real... Africa is in a really bad way. We just happen to be one of those enclaves that was really beautiful, and people are seeing the degradation and understand where it could be. So we... We, we self-deprecate because of the aspirational levels that we actually have. Because we, have, we are a people of excellence. We want better stuff for ourselves and our children. However, it's in the era. <laughs> okay. Um, you are very passionate about uh, when it comes to the arts and the creative. Um, yep. And uh, particularly hip-hop. Yep. And what's, what's your take on the current music that, that... Okay, what's your take on the current art that's coming out of this country currently? Dog. Everything that we tried to do 10 years ago has now come to fruition, right? We now have the Holy Tens, the same flows, and all this. Like, Zim Dancehall has now been totally sidelined by a really great crop of young Zim hip-hoppers who are speaking the language of the, of the ghettos. Of the ghettos, yeah. So, the Junior Browns were too ahead of their time. I mean, voice through the street, voice through the yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, he, he's been doing that for years. But right now, the, the time for, for this type of music and the, 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 everything is perfect for hip-hop where it is. So I'm very, you know, I'm very proud of where I'm seeing hip-hop uh, has gone. Yeah, I'm actually of, proud to see these kids buying cars, taking care of families. Taking care of families, you know, like, it was have, just booking, have managers that we can call and stuff. I mean, it's really good to see an industry grow like that. So uh, the lesson I've learned in that is, is patience, right? Sometimes it's not going to be in your lifetime, but what wise men who plant trees whose shade they'll never sit. Right. So when Alex was shooting the Togo Gara moment in Star FM with Inno that day, and we put it online, right, we never knew that one day of host yeah. JT would say, Junior Brown is my inspiration. True, true. true. Didn't know that. But remember, if you look at his age group, like, you know, he's 21. We put that out in 2023. So that's 10 years ago. He was 10 years old. You see what I'm saying? I, so I these it. seeds are planted many years ago, and now you've got all these great artists who have sort of cropped up. So a Junior Brown can sit there and be proud of what he's achieved, right? A Ten Diamond should be sitting there proud of what he's achieved. If you look at the Dena Mozis and, the, and sort of the, the, the branch that spring from that side of the Few Kings, right? The, the branch that flew down from the, you know, the MMT guys yeah, in yeah, the yeah. south, right? There's a whole there's a whole beautiful branch. You got these kids coming out of Gweru and Kwekwe and you know and the and the flow. I'm not going to find um, same um, same flow K flow. K flow, yeah. So we're now looking at stuff that Kelvin did. Oh yeah, that now so recent piece. The person, the, the person who, who murdered that kid, uh, he was bummed by a car, right? And they yeah. still haven't found. There hasn't been justice for that kid, right? There's been no justice for Kel. So. Uh, still on music and arts, you mentioned a lot of male voices. And there's always been this argument. Why are female artists not making an impact on the industry? Is it because they are not putting as... Uh, I mean, okay, I was talking about hip-hop, right? Uh, I mean, if you're talking about female artists in Zimbabwe, they're huge, right? Don't, don't forget the Mai Charambas and their girls who are also oh, yeah, yeah. selling multiple millions of records, right? Don't forget about the Amara Browns and the, you know, and, and, the, and, and the Tammy Moyos, you know? So... Yeah, I mean, but it always seems like there's only space for one at a certain time. You look at you look at the time when okay, Janet the, Manuel. Okay, like I mean, I don't know. There's always space for one. It's always a Janet Manuel, then it's always a Chihuahua, so then it's always a Tammy Moyo, then it's always an Amara, then it's always a Fendi, It's like there's how always, many men are there? It's, it's like it's like it's like there's always it's like there's always space for one Blaue artist. Well, there's always no, no, there's not always not one, by, there's always one space for one Ja Praiser and one Winky D. There's always one space for one you know. Holy Ten and one, you know, it's it, it, time infinitum, you know, John Lennon versus tell me McCartney. If, if you were to throw a gig right now, tell me five female artists that you would hire off the top of your head. Oh, there are Tammy, uh, Amara, I would hire. You see, it's getting tricky, right? It's getting tough. I'm an old nigga. I don't know these chicks. <laughs> like, I mean, why am I listening to young girls singing? I mean, but I'm saying, my son may be able to give you a better. Uh, oh, better no, 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 better no, 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 no. Uh, tell, tell me something. Tell me if. Uh, let's say I'm somewhere in Brazil and you're trying to sell Zimbabwe to me. Sell it to me. Let's hear it. Ish. Brazil. If I was in Brazil, anywhere in the world, if I was, let's say, if I was from anywhere in the world <laughs> and, and, then, and then you're like, yo, Zimbabwe, this is the, this is, Zimbabwe is the best country because of A, B, C, D. How will you sell that to me? If you're in a beautiful country with vast lands, great agriculture, great animals, and low to no crime come to Zimbabwe. Well, Tora, my animals, ne agriculture, ne shivano, asia. Why did you leave out the people? Great people as well. The best people. 
Okay. There's not one person who's traveled the world who does not say Zimbabwe has got the best people. Literally. Like, um, have you, uh, Lagos. <laughs> um, everybody there is trying to rob you somehow. All right. Whether physically, verbally, spiritually, <laughs> right? It's, it's a very, very hungry culture of 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 Kiribidi and you know and and, and Majet. Uh, Zim doesn't feel like that. You, know, you can still come to Zimbabwe and have a great time, live in a great hotel, go see the the wildlife, enjoy the the nightlife and stuff, and still have a great time here and not be robbed. Worst, you get someone break your window and steal a laptop out your car. I mean, that's the worst that I've sort of, I can say I've experienced. But the, it's a safe place to be. It's a safe place to visit. Now, if you come to South Africa, however, it, things are different. Things are far more ominous, right? So you you are going to have to be in a very safe environment in a, in a Santon, you know, in a, in a, in a closed-up environment with guards and AKs, right? You're not moving around. You're not going outside to jog with your earpods on. I mean... Dude, like it's not easy in other countries because the crime rates and stuff and the danger there is is, is so different. So raising your kids in Zimbabwe, if you if you got some money and stuff, this is the best place to raise your kids. So I I mean I would never ever say this uh with without being hundred percent serious. This is one of the best countries in the world. It's just one of the worst run at the moment. I hear you. And just in closing, right? Um for someone who always only engaged with you online and they've got this bias and this mis uh this misrepresentation of you what would you like to say to them i think that's the camera you're using yeah so i don't know you i got 170,000 followers on most platforms we don't know each other and we probably never will and we're in a natural situations where we're exposed to each other block mute fuck off i don't have to be a role model Anyway, guys, that's been the bold exchange. If nah, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm a nice guy. <laughs> if you've been offended, <laughs> it's good. If you uh, if you like, if you learn something new, it's good. That's the whole intention. And let's start the conversation. Kuda, thanks a lot for coming through, brother. Thank you for having me.